Welcome everybody to Secret Sauce, the show where we unpack business tips, life hacks, and advice from industry leaders. I'm Carly Iacono. Today, I am extremely honored to be joined by an industry veteran and true expert in commercial real estate, Chris Volk. Chris has not only taken two companies public in the net lease space, but is also a recently published author on business wealth creation. Welcome, Chris. We are so happy you could join us today. How are you? Well, Carly, I'm just delighted to be here and thanks for inviting me. So why don't you give our listeners who, who maybe aren't familiar with your very extensive and impressive background, a little bit of insight into how you got to uh, where you are today and what your current pursuits are. Well, I spent my career in the net lease space starting in 1986 and uh, joined a company in Arizona, uh, moving there from Atlanta, and I helped take that company public in 1994 and became president of that company. And we later sold it to GE. I uh, started a second company, took that public uh, 10 years later, so in 2004, and then another one public 2014 uh, after that. So altogether taken three companies public, two of them I co-founded. Uh, and altogether under my watch, we've done about $20 billion worth of investing. So just a, a lot. And it's all been in single tenant freestanding real estate assets. And you're for, very familiar with those kinds of assets. Absolutely. A, a real expert in single tenant, someone who I think has probably the deepest understanding of what's a good deal, what's not, and how to create value truly. So on that vein, tell us, before we jump into your thoughts on the market, tell us about this new book that you just published, which as I mentioned, I am a proud owner of, but have not fully digested. But it, I think it's fascinating. So, Love give, to. Us, so, so the, give us the take. Yeah. Love to. So the book is called The Value Equation, and it's a business guide to wealth creation for entrepreneurs, leaders, and investors. And it is probably the first book on business wealth creation ever done. And I just feel personally kind of honored and, and thrilled to have a shot at being able to do that because there's not much new in, in finance that you can do. And I've had an interest in this since uh, the late 90s, and I wrote my first articles on it and I've been doing it ever since and I've even done some video series while I was uh, leading store capital and uh, so the book basically will walk you through how businesses create wealth and, and the reason it's so important is because the throughout history the largest fortunes ever created were created by business people so this really walks you through how that happens and how what what's the math behind it so okay first of course, very important. How can our listeners find your book? Because everyone is going to need to read it to pick up these nuggets. So what's the easiest place to purchase the book and how do they get it in their hands? Well, Amazon's a good start. Uh, you can you can also download uh, e-copies on uh, Apple Books as well. And uh, uh, e-copies on Amazon or print copies on Amazon. And you can go to the website that I have, which is www.thevalueequation.com and uh, uh, link into it from there. So to get everyone excited about this book, give us a few high level nuggets. And just for the listeners who haven't seen the book yet, it's incredibly content rich. So this is not a light book, very, very meaty, very interesting, lots of depth. So I think probably, Chris, asking you for a few high level nuggets is tough because of the nature of the book. But give us something that you think might entice or kind of sum up some of the interesting points in the book. Well, the reason it's content rich is because there's there's some math to it, and the math is all middle school math, but it's math, and nonetheless, and and, uh, and of course, you can't really talk about wealth creation without talking about a little bit of math. Uh, but the book centers on uh, business models, and it takes corporate business models and it drills them down to six variables that are just universal across every single company, uh, and with those six variables, you can determine what your rates of return are going to be. You can also start to determine how much value you can create. And the goal is pretty basic. It's to create a company that's worth more than a cost to make. And that sounds pretty basic, but the truth of it is that most companies in the world aren't really more worth more than they cost to make. And uh, But the people that are on the Forbes 400, of course, have made these companies that are just gigantically worth more than they cost to create. And this kind of gives you an idea of what the fundamentals are to be able to do that. So let's go back to how this all started with NetLease. 
where do you see value in NetLease and or how did how did you during your career create value within NetLease? Well, I always thought of NetLease as a financing play. So uh, not just sort of a real estate investment. And at the end of the day, behind every net lease investment, there is a tenant. And that tenant has a choice of whether they rent that property or whether they own that piece of real estate. And uh, I spent the better part of my career convincing people they were better off having a landlord than a banker. Um, sometimes that landlord comes to you uh, in your business, in your line of work, uh, through a developer who convinces the, the, the tenant of the same thing. Let me build your building you know, lease it from me and the developer will turn around and maybe sell it and they may hire you to be able to do that. Um, uh, sometimes the companies do it direct. And in many cases, we would work with businesses directly as they would either build real estate or they would buy other companies that were laden with real estate and they were looking for a way to finance that real estate and they would sell it to us and rent it back. And it ended up being a better choice for them almost always because Unfortunately, or fortunately for you, perhaps, and, and for me, uh, there are just not that many really great uh, commercial real estate financing options for businesses today to own freestanding, uh, standalone real estate that they use in their business every day. So the focus, it sounds like, for your companies were sale lease backs, right? Did you ever take a look at stabilized deals or were you always working directly with a tenant to try to structure those in a, a format that you thought was most beneficial for, for both of you? We bought properties from others that were subject to existing leases, uh, mm -hmm. but most of the leases that we did, we created ourselves. So, uh, and I think that that was key to being able to create the value that we created. So uh, rather than being a middleman that was just buying real estate from other people, it was important for us to be able to have uh, in the companies that we created uh, uh, a sales origination team to be able to go out there. And, and the goal was pretty basic. We wanted to buy real estate that our investors couldn't buy. So we had a lot of shareholders. So we wanted to buy real estate that they were unlikely to see. Uh, we wanted to generate lease rates that they were unlikely to get themselves. So they were to do it themselves. We wanted to have lease structures that were better than what they could do uh, so that we were really creating value. It wasn't just an aggregation play where we were out there buying lots of real estate and throwing it into a public company. We wanted to do something that was better than what they could otherwise do themselves. It seems like there's a trend for shorter lease terms across the board, whether it be national tenants, local tenants, uh, build to suits, uh, lease backs, you know, what used to be a 25 or 20 year base term seems to be coming in at 10 or 15 in a lot of cases. Does that change your perception of the value of the property when considering a sale lease back or what would your commentary be on on lease terms kind of shifting overall? It does. It's, I think some of this is maybe due to the, some of the new lease accounting rules. I've always had this right. thought perhaps that with the new lease accounting rules where you're putting on a right to use asset and a right to use liability, it, it provides a, kind of an incentive for people to want to make that uh, asset as small as possible and that liability as small as possible, which you can do if you do short term leases. Um, one of my observations, and it's written in the book when we're talking about leasing versus owning, is that if a tenant could think of an ideal lease, uh, their ideal lease would be a one year lease with right. 41 year renewal options. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, that's what the tenant would want. Um, uh, and uh, and so always through my life, I, I think about what's the ideal financing that we would want, because sometimes it's not off the shelf and you have to create it. So there's no harm in asking. Um, uh, of course, landlords, for their part, can't do a one year lease with lots of renewal options. So they're going to uh, want to have much longer leases. I, as you start getting into 10, 15 year leases, it, it gets problematic, um, uh, especially, by the way, if you have five year lease escalators, because and, and a lot of the assets that you're probably selling or, or representing have oftentimes uh, uh, leases that are flat for five years and then they increase. So if you have a 10 year lease, then what happens is that you get one of those escalators and you're at the beginning of year six. And the second one is going to be happening at the beginning of year 11. But that, of course, is when your lease comes due. You know, it's, it's, it's now matured. And so uh, and if you're sitting there having financed this asset and you want to refinance it, there's no way that you can refinance it without going to the to the tenant and asking for a, an extension of the lease. Right. And when you do that, most likely they're never going to pay that lease escalation uh, or they're going to find another way to exact a cost from you. Uh, so I think investors have to understand that there is a cost. And while 10 years sounds 
far away for some people. It's not. I mean, I've been doing the lease business for well over 30 years and this time just creeps up on you. And um, and if you're, let's say, five years out, I mean, you have a five year lease, it starts becoming worth far less. I mean, and you would know from being on the broker side, if somebody's trying to uh, divest a property and it's got seven years or less of, of lease term on it, it becomes incredibly difficult to be able to do that. And from our perspective, we were willing to sort of take all that risk. We were doing a 15 to 20 year lease. We'll stay in the property up until like the, the last day. And uh, and and if uh, uh, we're never going to ask the tenant for an, an extension, the reason we're not going to is because we're not financing our assets in the CMBS market. We're not financing the assets in a place where we have any debt maturities. We're financing them with rolling unsecured debt or with uh, other types of debt that we can roll pretty easily, which is not available, by the way, to your average real estate investor. And so this is why it becomes really paramount to try to have as long a lease term as you can get. Very good insight. How important was the tenant relationships to you at these companies? Of course, you had large teams managing the portfolios, but did you have a lot of conversations in advance of lease renewals? So you had a good pulse on what the tenant was doing. Um, and, and did you build those relationships through scale or were, did you have just an amazing diversity of tenants and you approached it that way? So the relationships were harder to maintain. Mm -hmm. Almost all the relationships we've had across the three platforms that I've led have been direct relationships. Um, we've known the tenants pretty intimately. Uh, our focus through the, for the most part has been on what we call profit center real estate. So profit center real estate is real estate where people generate their sales and profits on a, on a property. So um, one of the hot property types today is industrial assets. Industrial assets most likely don't have a, a unit level PL. They're not profit center assets. Uh, so we stayed away from logistics type assets like a FedEx property is not a profit center. Um, but a veterinary clinic's a profit center, a restaurant's a profit center, early child education's a profit center, fitness clubs are profit centers. We had manufacturing facilities for the profit centers. And we would get the unit level PLs of these on a quarterly basis because that was always part of the, uh, the transaction. And when you get the unit level PLs, you have a very clear idea whether they're going to renew or not renew because you know whether the properties are really making any money for them. So economically, you understand how viable they are. Um, the other thing is we're very big believers in alignments of interest. We've always been huge believers in that. So you want to write leases where the tenant and you are on the same side of the table and you're not trying to have confrontations with one another. And one of the ways to do that is to when you're doing multi-unit properties, do them in a single master lease, uh, where mm -hmm. uh, now it's not just a single one choice where they can renew or not renew an individual asset. They may have five or 10 assets that are in the same lease and they're choosing to renew all or none of the, uh, the properties. And so now it's not just the profitability of a single asset that matters, but the profitability of the aggregate pool of assets of 10. Um, so we would focus on things like that to be able to have strong alignments of interest. And um, and you can do that, by the way, in, in middle market real estate. It's much more difficult to do that with investment grade tenants because they write their own leases. Right, right. Love that insight. What, if any, well, I'm going to take off, if any, what challenges do you see facing commercial real estate in the near term and specifically net lease? What are you watching right now? Well, I mean, the obvious thing is interest rates. and, and um, the market's been adversely hit by interest rates recently and fears of rates rising. And uh, um, and, and uh, as rates rise, it just elevates the cost of financing for people. And if it elevates the cost of financing, they're going to try to push the cap rates north. But uh, as you know better than anybody else, in real estate, it's always hard to uh, squeeze cap rates up uh, or squeeze valuations down. It happens, but it's a, it, there's a lag to it. It doesn't happen immediately. Uh, so... So the challenge for people that are in the net lease space, of course, is uh, being able to try to adjust to uh, higher rate moves. And the problem with high rate moves sometimes is that there's a double whammy that ha that happens with higher rates, which is that the investors, if we were selling fixed income bonds to institutional investors, those investors are likewise incredibly nervous about where rates are going. And so what they'll do is they'll start charging us even more. So the, the spreads of debt go out. So you not only have the Federal Reserve increasing the rates, but then you have this, the absolute spreads. And so 
you can actually have the, the rates go up by double whatever the move in the interest rate is, depending on what happens to the spreads. And that's been happening. Um, uh, so uh, so that's that's the you know the biggest challenge today facing the net lease space and, and the participants that are in the net lease space is trying to figure out the financing conundrum. Um, now, the good thing is that uh, you know, the 10 year treasury is still kind of hovering south of uh, 3% by and large, uh, which is pretty low uh, historically. Uh, cap rates are relatively attractive relative to that absolute number. It's not like they're that bad, but the, uh, the problem for them now is that the, uh, the debt spreads are wide. And, and once those come back in, which they will, I mean, they just come back in over time, then uh, you know, landlords will have an easier time of it. I agree, and you're exactly right. That is something we're dealing with and watching very closely is that spread between cap rates and interest rates because it's where a lot of the value is. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting time for sure from the financing perspective. Are there any sort of life hacks or personal advice or tips that you'd like to share? Life hacks? Um, well, you you asked a question to me some time back on whether what what stressed me out or how did I manage with stress? And uh, one of the things that we'd always do with, with stress is just um, buy good real estate assets that were <laughs> profitable and uh, not put too much debt on them and, and have a diversified pool. Uh, I mean, you can sleep a lot better at night when you're doing that. And um, uh, I've also been fortunate enough to be married for 41 years. Uh, uh, having a stable personal life has been very important to me. <laughs> and uh, that definitely lowers the stress. And then the, uh, Biggest life hack, I think, is that uh, for me anyway, um, uh, business has been a creative venture. We've created lots of different financing uh, tools in, in the Netly space over the years. And uh, sometimes the best ideas come to me when I'm barely conscious. So I could be a twilight sleep almost. Um, and uh, uh, and then the important thing is to remember that. And um, and the best place to be in twilight sleep is in the shower. And I remember most of the stuff that I, that I <laughs> in, in the shower. So that's my personal hack in terms of uh, being able to uh, uh, find uh, uh, my best creative moments. So do you have a notepad right on your bathroom sink then? As soon as you get out, you furiously write it down or, or on your phone. How do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, got, I got a notepad and I, and I, and I write it. it down and I, uh, I think it's pretty, yes. Carry it through everywhere. Wonderful. I do. Any any closing thoughts on the market, on your journey, or anything personal that you'd like to to wrap up with today? No, I I, I would say that that uh, uh, one of the issues that is going to happen with uh, net lease is that uh, uh, the net lease space for public companies is one of the uh, most challenged from a valuation perspective today. Uh, so that's the other thing that, that net lease companies have to deal with, especially if they're public companies. And uh, um, and I think that that too will will uh, will pass. But we need to get through this moment where we are today, where uh, interest rates are, and nobody knows where they're going to top out. But my guess is they'll be okay. I mean, um, when we were going through pre the Great Recession in two thousand five six, the ten year Treasury rate was four fifty. Uh, cap rates really weren't that far north of where they are today, and we generated returns for our investors of 19%. So you can do it. Um, uh, I, all you need is some stability in the marketplace and some comfort from investors. And even at a 450 10-year treasury, you can do it. So one follow-up question on that. If the REITs are, are facing valuation challenges, would you say this is a good time to invest as a, a private investor? Is it is it not? Where how does someone not on the inside look at this and and make sense of it from an investment standpoint? I think it's a magnificent time to buy net lease stocks today. Uh, I think it's a great time if you look at net lease stocks. They're trading at levels um, that are depressed, and and if you look at the depressed levels of in the in the REIT space. You have office, you have healthcare REITs, you have shopping malls, and then kind of in with that whole group is net lease. But unlike the rest of them, net lease has no secular problems. I mean, it is, it's all fear of rates. And then the odd thing is it's fear of inflation too. And by the way, inflation can actually help some of the net lease guys out because it lowers your rent to sales ratios. You have fewer vacancies, fewer defaults. You know, I mean, real estate values do pretty well. So, um, I, so I would just say that, uh, uh, today would be a great time to to buy the stocks. And one one of the things I would note is that in the three companies that I took public, every one of them 
outperform the broader read benchmarks. I mean, every single one of them. And uh, and I've always thought that that basically is a sign that net lease has always been underappreciated, that people don't value it properly relative to everybody else, because really we shouldn't outperform everybody else. It should not have happened because we're not, we don't have people zoning, you know, zoning properties. We're not taking entitlement risk. We're not taking the risk that so many companies take. We're, we're just buying real estate. It's there. It's rented on a long-term basis. So how do you outperform like that? It's because the REIT market tends to undervalue net lease, which is why uh, especially today, where net lease is so so lowly valued relative to other sectors, from single family residential to industrial, um, net lease shines as a place to invest. I'm glad you share the same passion I do for this market segment. So refreshing to hear that perspective. I think there's incredible opportunity both from the stock investing side, which obviously I'm not as knowledgeable on, but on the real estate side as well. So uh, com completely agree. Chris, this, this has been fantastic. We're very grateful for your time and sharing your insights. Can't wait to finish reading your book. Highly recommend everyone pick up a copy of that. And thank you very much for, for all of that knowledge and your perspective on the market. McCarley, it's been a pleasure. To everyone watching, that was Secret Sauce. We hope that you'll join us again very soon. Have a great day.